Welcome, everyone, to our second panel of the day, Making Theatre Sustainable. We have an absolute great panel today, and we can't wait for them to share their experience with you. My name is Bat Saber. I'm currently on a gap year, part of Mousetrap Theatre Live Youth Forum, which I've been a member for about three, four years now. I'm currently wearing a bright pink theatre craft top, light brown trousers, and white trainers. Your pronouns? Oh, and my pronouns, sorry, are she, her. Hi everyone, my name is Darcy. I'm also going to be hosting this panel of Bat Saber. Really excited to hear all the incredible insights from you guys today. Um, I'm an actress and I also work with Mousetrap Youth, um, Mousetrap Theatre Projects. I'm wearing a pink theatre craft top and marine trousers and white trainers. My pronouns are she, her. Um, hello everybody, my name's Susie. I'm the head of production at Birmingham Rep. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I'm a white female, nearly 40, uh, with uh, longish uh, auburn hair, and I'm wearing a blue top. Hi, I'm Will Reynolds. Um, I'm, uh, my pronouns are he, him. Um, I'm wearing, uh, and I think entirely secondhand <laughs> outfit of clothes, which explains the massive holes in the knees. Um, uh, a red jumper which says climate and ecological, ecological and climate emergency on it, which I printed at an Extinction Rebellion protest, which I really love. Um, I'm a, a freelance uh, set, lighting and video designer, and I also run a Meta Theatre, a touring theatre company. Hi, uh, I'm Josie, she, her. Um, I am wearing a very on-brand pink <laughs> long sleeve top. Um, I've got dyed red hair, and I've also got slippers on, which <laughs> was a choice, but I made it. So, yeah, that's me. Amazing. And before we start with our presentations for our three guests, please, everyone, in the meantime, have questions ready as there will be a Q&A happening afterwards to kick us off. Right. This is, let's see if this works. Oh, I think out there. That's me. I'm Susie and I'm the head of production at Birmingham Rep. And apparently, if I press this, I'll get a PowerPoint. There we go. So that's just going to hopefully play behind me in the background. Do I press it again? It's a question. Let's see if that works in a second. Um, I'll, this will play behind me in the background. I'll just do a bit of chatting in front. The Rep was one of the first producing Rep houses in the UK, and the majority of what is seen on our stages is built and made by our in-house carpentry and metal workshop, paint shop, props workshop, costume and lighting teams. Not a problem. That's not a problem. No worries. Do you want me to repeat that? That's fine. Um, so the Rep was one of the first producing houses in the UK, and the majority of what is seen on our stages is built and made by our in-house carpentry and metal workshop, paint shop, props workshop, costume and lighting teams. We are the only producing theatre in Birmingham. We are very much on a journey to look at the environmental impact of our shows and how we can work in a more sustainable way. The images that are being shown hopefully give you an idea of the facilities that we have at the Rep. So to quote the Green Book, sustainability in theatre has been discussed for a really long time. However, everybody was trying to do it differently and was struggling with the knowledge, process and support, which is why the creation of the Theatre Green Book Volume 1, Sustainable Productions, was so revolutionary. It created a framework to be able to reduce the environmental impact of a project by highlighting what needs to happen at each stage and by presenting clear targets. So the Theatre Green Book addresses all areas of theatre making, including the creative challenge, producing, making and disposal and technical, highlighting the responsibility for making sustainable theatre does not sit purely with one personal department, but that it is a shared responsibility. There are three levels of Green Book processes, baseline, intermediate and advanced. And just to explain, the Green, Theatre Green Book was introduced about two years ago as a way to aid theatres to make more sustainable productions. The Green Book sets out the full production process from contracting creatives with a green production agreement through to the green design meetings, the appointment of a sustainability champion through to the making of a physical production and then the disposal or second life of the project. Baseline and intermediate levels require the projects to keep a materials inventory and track all items that are used on a project with, following, with the following targets. Baseline, 50% of materials in must have had a previous life and 65% of materials out must be reused or recycled at the end of the project. 
For intermediate, that 75% of materials in must have had a previous life, and 80% must be recycled at the end. Advanced projects require the use of a carbon budget and a carbon calculator and have 100% targets. I'll be honest, we at the RAP haven't got anywhere near being able to achieve that. The Green Book also has a great appendix for each department for specific advice, advice on materials to use and not use and guidance on best practices. The Theatre Green Book is free to access and can be found online. So why am I telling you about all of this? How do we practically use it at the REP? At the REP, we've completed one Green Book show. Ta-da! Um, and purely by adding this to our repertoire, we've already started to embed a change of ethos in the way we operate. Um, you can see some images, if I can get the clicker to work, of our show, uh, Would You Bet Against Us? So this is the set design. Every element of the set, um, apart from the lycra, had had a previous life. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Here's some show pictures of it. Um, and the set and the show continue to be performed by Told by an Idiot as part of their repertoire. Therefore, none of it so far has been disposed of. Um, by taking this project on, and also by being more aware, we are now adopting this practice as standards. We produce a design brief for all projects, which includes a statement stating what our environmental credentials are. Uh, doo -doo -doo. It's very exciting, the clicker. So, we took this to heart when making Playboy of the West Indies previously this year. This show was a co-production, and the show was meant to be transferring. So we hadn't planned to be doing any disposal or recycling at the end of the project. However, on the Thursday before the final performance at the rep, the co-producers decided it would be cheaper to rebuild the set when it was needed rather than to store it. So he asked us to skip it. A couple of years ago, this would have practically meant that we put all the items that we didn't want to keep in our stores in a skip. But thankfully, the world has moved on, and instead the workshop team spent a day salvaging all the components that would be reused for other projects, and by separating the timber from the metal frame so that the metal could be recycled as scrap and the timber could also be recycled. All other elements we found a home for. The palm trees and the boat went to a scare fest in Sussex. The flattage went to a scenic constructor who works for Greenpeace called Sustain Theatre, and I've even got some of the shelving in my garden. <laughs> um, so... This might work, might not. Some other practices that we're changing at the rep. We're in the process of working through all of our suppliers and asking them for their environmental policies so that we can try and ensure we know where all of our materials come from. We're trialing more sustainable paints, timbers and glues. We're actively trying to ensure we do bulk ordering and if multiple departments use the same supplier, trying to make sure that there is one order, not four going in. We're trying to plan our van journeys to minimize trips. We no longer use vac form bricks, and we see and see all of these instead. We only reimburse for train journeys, and therefore we minimise our car trips. And we ask performers to consider what they put in the laundry after every performance to minimise our use of the laundry. We're looking at carbon literacy training for all staff, and are planning on including a sustainability induction for all staff, freelancers, and casuals. We're very conscious that we may work with creatives and freelancers who are not as far down the sustainability journey as we are, or maybe actually ahead of us. And as such, we're endeavouring to create a guide of materials we would suggest using and alternatives to traditional materials that are harmful to the environment. We are also aware that we may work with people whose knowledge and experience exceeds ours, and we're keen to learn from colleagues in the industry to keep assessing and reviewing our practices. Outside the production department, we're embedding sustainable practice around the building. We've got an environmental working group, which helps ensure improvements are constantly made. We review our suppliers for our cafe and bar, and we're currently taking an environmental audit to try and ensure our operations and building are working as effectively as possible. We are also ensuring we look into where our funding and investments come from, and to make sure we aren't funded by anyone who profits from unsustainable actions. We're a proud member of Sustainable Arts West Midlands, a, no a new network open to any individual or organisation in the arts in the West Midlands who wants to join to create a network to share best practices and resources and to hold each other to account. We're a long way from doing everything we should, but we are trying and we're constantly aiming to approve. I'm just going to click this a lot now. <laughs> <laughs> no, it works. Here's some of the pictures of that show. Uh, that's the shelving that's in my garden. That's me. I love it. Thank you so much, Susie. 
I'm just gonna, I'm gonna keep clicking. <laughs> Okay. We'll get around to you in a minute. <laughs> this was a great show. It's a picture of uh, some more of the sets. Da, da, da. Do you want to? Oh, there you go. There we there go. You go. <laughs> See if I can get it to work for me. <laughs> oh, oh, hello. There we go. <laughs> Shall I go now? I guess. Yeah. I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry, Will. <laughs> um, great. Wasn't ready for that. Hello again. Um, so yeah, my name is Josie, um, and I am a independent theatre maker and producer. Um, We've recently shut down, but I was also co-director of Staging Change um, with Alice Boyd. And Staging Change was an artist-led network which supports theatre makers responding to the climate crisis. Um, it was originally born out of a sustainable fringe campaign in 2018. I've just realised like it's shut down. I don't know why I'm telling you about it, but I feel like it's probably useful to know. Um, <laughs> um, it was yeah, it was born out of a sustainable fringe campaign in 2018. Um, and it was a network by the end that consisted of almost 400 theatre makers, venues and organisations all working together to try and make the theatre industry more environmentally sustainable. Um, we ran campaigns, offered consultancy, we did workshops and we generally were a bridge between sort of early career theatre makers and bigger organisations because I think there's a lot of learning that can happen between the two and that conversation doesn't often happen. Um, we also started making creative responses um, with home and David Shearing in the form of installations and audio work. Um, and then outside of Staging Change, I run This Egg, um, under which I produce, co-create, and perform different theatre shows. Um, so more and more, I guess, I make shows that are rooted in some kind of a hope for change. Um, and that means that they usually stem from a social issue or injustice of some sorts. And I guess as I've been producing and making that work, um, I've sort of tried to figure out how the producing can reflect the message of the show and vice versa. Um, and I think sustainability is a really clear example of this. Um, I guess, generally, as an independent maker and theatre company, I wonder what we can do differently and in a more climate conscious way. Um, and being a very small company of just me, like the flexibility is a really big part of that. And it means that we're able to make changes much more quickly than a bigger organization. Um, so I'm going to talk for a couple of shows that I thought would be useful to think about as starting points. Um, and yeah, take or leave what's useful to you as I'm talking. Um, very briefly then, Me and My Bee um, was a show that um, was made for family audiences. We started making it in 2016, uh, and the tagline was, climate change is massive, bees aren't. Um, <laughs> it was a political party disguised as a party party, disguised as a show, and our aim was to recruit new members to our bee party. Um, it followed the story of a bee and a flower, and then the flower turns into a building. Um, so that's that. <laughs> um, the thinking behind the show is mostly about making audiences feel like they could make a difference, no matter how small they were as people, um, but also how small the changes that they were making and sort of showing that anything can have an impact. And it was very much about cause and effect. Um, that show, we toured, I'd say, like 99% on public transport. Um, and that wasn't really actually, honestly, a environmental decision. It was sort of like practical and um, also to do with cost and the fact that Joe was the only person that could drive. So it's that as well. Um, although most of the props and costumes at the time were very plastic heavy, um, and I have to say, again, like not necessarily always sourced in the most sustainable way, we still did and we still do this show. So yeah, that's something I guess that sort of speaks to what you were saying about actually not disposing of something because it's still running. Um, in 
Yeah. In um, summer 2021, we remounted the show with Oxford Playhouse and we put environmental sustainability at the heart of every choice that we made from the outset. So I guess from the way that I was sort of talking about the process in the first instance, we weren't necessarily thinking about our process and our practice, but became more and more conscious of that as we were sort of going around touring and we were like, we can't really talk about these things with audiences if we're not practicing them ourselves. Um, so when we did the show back in 2021, we used the Theatre Green Book um, and sort of used the way that we were sourcing and disposing or planning to anyway um, of those things as a, as a case study for the Theatre Green Book. Um, and I guess practically, again, this meant like materials inventories and um, how we were going to travel. We had an electric car, um, which was very difficult to charge. Um, and I think I sort of say that as a joke, but it's sort of reflective to me of how difficult some of these choices can be because they're always, there's always another... It's a double-edged sword, basically. There's always something that you're also compromising. And in that case, it was a stage manager's time sat driving outside of Oxford to charge the car for days on end, um, literally. So, yeah, there's that. Um, there is also a full report on how that went, which I will find a way to share with you. Um, it's quite long, but if you find this kind of thing interesting, then hopefully the report will also be interesting and maybe useful as well. Um, we also made a film adaptation of this. Do I dare click it again? <laughs> ah, it will come up. Um, we made a film adaptation of the show. Um, I'm still not fully sold on digital work, I think, like generally, but also the argument that it's a greener choice. Um, but there is no doubt that it can exist and reach more audiences than a small-scale touring show, which is... Oh, double-click there. <laughs> OK, well, you sort of saw a flash of the film. Um, <laughs> going back to me and my bee, she says, um, the show performed over 250 times across the UK, and we still use the same props. They are still sat in my flat. I think that's another thing. <laughs> You sort of end up like collecting a lot of things when you're trying to do env environmental stuff. But um, yeah, we still use the same props. So the life cycle of everything that we had and that we sourced back in 2016 is really long. Um, and that is important. Now, we don't know for sure when we start making a project that that's the kind of life that it will have, um, especially as a small company. Like you sort of make the show and you hope that people will pick it up and a show lasting this long, from my experience, is really rare. Um, so we can do better from the start. Um, so this is a picture from a show called Mother Earth. Um, and we'd set some more clear goals before starting. So for example, we decided that everything, we started doing this R&D before the Theatre Green Book existed. So we were sort of making up our own goals. But now I would definitely recommend using that as your sort of resource. Um, but. Uh, yeah, we decided that everything that we put into the room was going to have had a life before. Um, and we also worked with a natural dyer on the costumes. So we were using um, sort of scraps of different fashion outlets that were getting rid of materials. But we were like, OK, how do we make sure that our piece still feels like our piece and like we have our own creative control over it? And yeah, we sort of worked with... Um, Katrina Wilde, who is amazing, um, on dyeing all of that stuff. And she would go around like collecting waste food products from cafes near where we were rehearsing and then dye the costumes, which was wicked as a process generally as well. Um, now, because this show's still in development, I can't reflect on it too much yet. But um, what we did do during rehearsals is like we thought more deeply about how the people in the project contribute to the mission of the show. and again, like reflecting what we're asking of audiences. Um, and I guess for this one, it was particularly around like how we can share responsibility. So for example, how we can make changes as a collective in the rehearsal process as well. Um, one example of that was a cooking rotor um, and only rehearsing in places that had kitchens. Um, 
which is just a generally lovely thing to do. Um, and I, I think that the thing about this for me is the impact that it has on the company of people that you're working with. Um, and I guess the time and care that goes into those people and how we invest in relationships, which if we put more time in when it comes to our relationship with nature, in my opinion, could also be more positive. Um, and I guess also like when we're making work about the climate crisis generally, there's something about um, trying to build a reconnection with the, with the people that are like having to deal with the consequences of the climate emergency and um, reconnecting with the feelings that the emergency can bring up. Um, and Mother Earth sort of started as a project because I was noticing a lot of apathy in the topic um, around me as well as like myself feeling sort of nothing about it anymore um, and I wanted to make something that used those feelings of apathy as well as grief and anxiety and despair to do something um, or to feel something again and then do something. Um, which all sounds a little bit grim, but I think it's about acknowledging that we're in it together and that we have each other and that this is global. Um, so on that, we made a film version of Mother Earth. Um, and the idea for the film, I guess, was partly because of lockdown, um, partly because the show was really visual, partly because I wanted to show real locations, um, partly because I thought it could be an interesting experiment in environmental sustainable working um, where there was still possibility to collaborate internationally. Because um, I think that's another thing with the climate crisis, we sort of like go very insular and I wanted to sort of stay out. Um, and this project is commissioned by British Council for COP27. So um, COP27 is starts on the 7th of November um, and this project is part of their creative commission for climate action, a global program exploring climate change through art, science and digital technology. <laughs> That's the kind of thing you have to say. Um, it's a film and podcast project um, and hopefully will be a live show again soon too. Um, so this is a shot from um, Mother Earth in Indonesia where they are in the middle of a forest that is being um, deforested by a palm oil organization. Um, so that was their chosen location for the film. Um, so all of this is to sort of say, as a small scale touring company, the things that I think about are fundraising, who and where to get the money from, design, sourcing, and afterlife of the actual physical things, uh, touring, the different touring models, travel, accommodation, venues, marketing, um, impact and offsetting, um, the process, like who are the partners and what can they do differently or do we think the same as them? Um, and then how, how all of this intersects with other missions that you might be on. So for example, thinking around access and inclusion and I, I sort of mention that because they don't always work super smoothly together. Again, it's that sort of double-edged sword, but um, it's, not an all, it's not always an obvious choice and one choice won't always feel like it fits both. But you have to just, yeah, sort of keep conscious about why you're making each choice that you're making. Um, and I think managing that is a big part of the solution. Um, a lot of everything I've said equals so much time and money as well. Um, but like I've said, it's about choices and it's about values. And I think it's about goals and boundaries and about integrity as well, I guess. Um, and most importantly, it's about remembering that as people working in the arts, we have a capacity to tell stories um, and share ideas about the world. and how we use what we do to inspire other people. So there's no point in all of us doing our own little changes and processes and sourcing and all of that if we can't encourage other people and engage audiences in the topic more generally. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave it there. 
Thanks for listening. <laughs> if this is me now. There we go. <clears throat> um, I'm Will. I'm artistic director of Meta Theatre, which is a company we founded uh, nearly 20 years ago now, um, and also a freelance set lighting and video designer. So I'm just going to, if this works, I'm just probably going to say the same thing again now. There we go. Somewhere in here. Oh, jumping on. Um, so this is, I'm just going to, I have nothing nearly so thorough as <laughs> these two wonderful <laughs> before me. Um, I'm a freelance uh, designer as well as running Meta. This was uh, Tubular Bells at the South Bank Centre that I did the lighting and sorted the set for in a uh, sort of concert and circus performance uh, last year, I think that was. Um, some of these are just going to... There we go. This was the gambler here. I did the video that you can almost see in that background a uh, long, long time ago, maybe 10, maybe more than 10 years ago, uh, up, upstairs here. Um, this sort of works more smoothly when I can whiz through them. <laughs> <laughs> where do I have to point it? There we go. Uh, uh, as well as being a, a freelance designer, I also run Meta Theatre, where um, sort of the environment and sort of inclusion and diversity and sort of, in general, untold stories and a socially conscious sort of way of thinking about the world have been sort of integral to everything we do right from the beginning. Um, <clears throat> this, was a, this was a show that sort of tried to include all of those things together that we did. This was our, the biggest show we've done in 2019, this was. This did a, a four-month mid- to large-scale tour. It was a new musical. The show was called In the Willows. Uh, sort of family friendly uh, modernization and urbanization of the Wind in the Willows story. Um, a big, big show, sort of, again, this, is, this predates the Green Book, so this was sort of a lot reusing, using a lot of our own thinking about how we do things environmentally. Um, and I guess I think the thing for me about the Green Book is the way that it has sort of codified and brought together a lot of things that a lot of individuals were already doing. Um, and sort of helped us understand how they fit together and how to do them as we were and more so than before. So I think that's where that sort of comes in really useful. If this jumps on again. Oh. This is our next show, um, which we're doing at Christmas down in Taunton, um, where we are now. So now that Green Book has come out, we did a, a show trying to follow the, the... We were aiming for the advanced standard. We certainly didn't meet it um, in, in every area, um, I think we probably mostly made the, the intermediate in most of it. Um, and again, we've written up a sort of case study of that and put it up on the Theatre Green Book website. So there's quite a lot of sort of case studies and information about that on the, on the Green Book website. Um, we're again sort of trying to follow that, follow the Green Book, sort of loosely aiming for the, the intermediate standard again um, for this show at Christmas. This is a co-production with the, the Taunton Brew House. Um, which adds in a whole new level of complication when you're trying to sort of add in new things that not everybody has done before, and you're also co-producing. Um, makes things a bit more difficult. Um, as well as the theatre company, and because we've been sort of working on, on this environmental stuff for a long time, uh, since, since the beginning of the company, nearly 20 years ago, um, during the pandemic, when we weren't able to be out actively producing work in the same way, we, we thought... And, and obviously the, the Green Book and the, the time that everybody suddenly had to think about what they were doing as, and how they did it as well. And it felt like now was a point where lots more people were sort of starting to try and think about sustainability in how they make their work. Um, so we set up Meta Green as a sort of arm of what we do as the company. Again, a sort of consultancy effort, sort of trying to help other people um, with, their, with their sustainability journeys. Um, so it, that has sort of formalized how important it is to us as a company. Um, this is just some examples of, of some of the work we've done on previous productions. The first one, the one on the, um, this one here with the red, and the, the red and the blue train and lorry was... So these are our carbon footprints from, from previous productions. This was a tour of Jungle Book, uh, a hip-hop version of Jungle Book, uh, and uh, a circus musical of The Little Mermaid on the other side. Um, just sort of break... So this is using Julie's Bicycles... Um, carbon calculating 
tools which have been available for a long time um, and are notoriously difficult to use if you're touring. Um, but that, that just sort of gives a, a rough breakdown of where our emissions fall. This is just for our, our part of the production. We're a touring company, so we don't go into, we don't have sort of any control or any access to the information about what our theatre partners, the venues that we're going to, you know, their heating and their, all of that kind of thing in the, in the building. So this is just the actual production and the touring part of it. Um, but I think that the, the really important thing for me that I hadn't necessarily clocked was going to be true when I started doing this work was just how much of that footprint for a touring company comes from transport. Um, uh, so 93% in, in total on people and, and equipment transport for the Jungle Book and 70, 79 for The Little Mermaid. So very high proportion. So, so essentially what that's saying is very little of the footprint is in the materials and the stuff that we use directly. It's in mostly how we move them around and how many people and how we move the people around. Um, which is all sort of covered very well in the Green Book, but, but actually, you know, before the Green Book existed, I think loads of people didn't really realize this. Um, and that was the end of that. <laughs> there we go. Um, so that, that's just, um, just highlighting the, the importance of, of, that, of the transport side of it, and particularly the, the equipment and the set and the lighting and everything that we're moving around. When we take a, a, a tour out on the road, most of our shows use one of these big lorries. We, I think we are sort of doing quite well compared to a lot of the shows that, on a sort of comparable scale. We tend to be touring musicals to, to mid to large-ish scale theatres, and you know, a lot of the comparable shows that do that tend to be taking two or three of these trucks around. Um, so we're working quite hard on, on how we keep that down, and I think probably we've put at least as much, if not more, focus into how we just minimise the amount of material we're using in order to minimise how much we're transporting. As well as, but sort of sometimes on top of, or, or over and above, what those materials are, um, or where they've come from. Because actually, you know, from our point of view, not having it and therefore not moving it is, is infinitely preferable to it being well-sourced. You know. um, so that's so an awful lot of our effort goes into how to minimise what we're, what we're taking around with us. Um, uh, and again, Jesse, as you, as you touched on, the vast majority of the impact that we have in the world... So I, did, I should have said on those, the, the slides of our actual footprint, for one of our shows, touring for... Um, uh, the, so the, the Willows was slightly higher because it was a longer tour, but our other shows sort of touring for one, two, even three months. They have a footprint directly attributed to the show of about 10 to 12 tonnes of, of carbon, which is, to put that into context roughly one person's annual footprint in this country, on average. Um, so their footprint is not very big in the, in the grand scheme of things. But if we can talk to people about what we're doing, then the, the reach you know, and, and hope that some other people will, will think about what they're doing in response to that, our reach as storytellers in cultural terms is absolutely ginormous. So this, is, this was just to remind me to say that this was uh, oil at the Almeida uh, again, quite a long time ago now, but, but I found that a really powerful show in sort of making me think about the, the roots of the problem, what we need to do to change it, and how we need to think about everybody. Again, as you're saying, everybody who's involved in this, um, where the impacts of, of climate change are being felt the most um, around the world, where they're being felt the most here, where they're, you know, what the effects are going to be, who's creating the, the worst problems, who's most able to start addressing them first, all of that. So there's an awful lot in that, which I think as cultural producers, we're, we're sort of almost possibly the most important people to be talking about that, I think. Um, because there's no way that any of this is going to get even close to being changed on the scale and the urgency that it needs to be done if sort of culture, our culture broadly, doesn't, doesn't sort of lead the way. Um, clicking away. Madly here, there we go. This was just to sort of quickly point out that there are, in fact, staging changes still on there. It shouldn't be anymore. <laughs> um, just to point out there are a lot, a lot of people and groups sort of coming together to try and help each other and to think about sustainability in this um, in various different ways um, with various different sort of types of resources and, and sort of inspirational approaches to it. Um, and then this was just again to remind me, just to say, we're here in a theatre, 
but actually sort of the performing arts and the theatre world has a huge influence sort of across all types of different art forms. So this is the Reading Festival, obviously, where there's an awful lot being work done in festivals. Um, there's an awful lot of work being done in live music, touring, um, you know, and, and differently and needs to be done differently within each of those sectors. But of course, there's also an awful lot of crossover as well. Um, one of the other initiatives I've been involved in recently is sort of trying to set up a cross art form group in the Southwest to work with museums, with the heritage sector, with arts, you know, arts of all types, as well as theatre, and sort of bring what we've learned and can share with them and, and learn from what all sorts of other people are, are doing. Um, and I think that that kind of cross art form and sharing between each other and, and between everybody is, is just sort of super helpful. And that is the end of me. I'll go on to that. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was absolutely incredible. We are going to ask some questions now and then we're going to go to the audience. I have a question. Josie spoke about the challenges and compromises that are needed to be within this space. And I think this is probably something that resonates for a lot of people in the audience. I know when I'm making on a very small scale, it's harder because you don't have as much resources. So do you have any advice for young theatre makers on how to negotiate those really difficult decisions and where they should look towards. I know the Theatre Green Book is something we've spoken about, but is there anything else that's really aided you in that? Oh, um, I guess um, maybe this is like a slight left field answer or maybe I'm dodging the question, so pull me up if I am. But I think one of the things that I've felt is the most useful and impactful both for myself and people or organizations around me is asking questions. Um, whether that's like asking myself why I've made a choice or are there other options? Is this the only option? Um, as well as just really gently, like you can challenge people through asking questions and they can be open. They don't have to be like a, why aren't you doing this? It's like, what genuinely, mm -hmm. why are you not doing this or have you considered this or could we have some more information on where your funding comes from you know so I think yeah I, I think for me it's about asking questions and knowing why you're doing what you're doing in the way that you're doing it thank you so much and now we're going to open up the questions to everyone else in the house we have a question down here, Nadia, just here. Please say your name so then we can relay that as well back to our panelists. No, so I have a question for Josie, because um, you kind of made me think about like freelancing and sustainability. Um, I'm a young designer, I've just graduated, and I have wanted to be able to bring up these questions with producers and directors that, you know, I'm potentially working with, but, like, how do I bring that up as a conversation without sounding annoying and difficult? Because um, I feel like you bring, they've got budget, and you talk about sustainability, and they're like, oh my god, how much is this going to cost? Like, how much is it going to be extra? And I find that... I'm not taken seriously as a designer, and I feel like I'm not going to be taken seriously as a designer if I start talking about sustainability until my practice is firm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Amazing. Could we have your name, please? Oh, yeah. Uh, my name's Sayla. Samira. Sayla. Sayla. Perfect. Thank you so much, Sayla. Sayla's question was aimed at Josie, and the question was, as a young graduate, as a young designer, how are they able to bring about the conversations of sustainability to producers without feeling as though they won't be taken seriously, being so young and just coming out of graduation? It's really sad to hear that question, I think, um, because, as in because it's, it's a genuine concern, and I think that, um, I guess part of me is like, Oh, are we really still feeling like that? And it's, I, I guess, like, part of me is just like, yeah, I, I totally know what you mean. And I feel the same, even if I'm, like, going to a funder whose tick box is, like, environmental practice, you're still saying, 
Because the reality of that is asking for more money and more time and, and different timelines and restructuring a process. But you're still saying, like, it, it's still, yeah, you feel bad asking. Um, to be honest, though, like, I'm like, unless you, unless we stay really firm in what we want and how we imagine that looks like, um, I'd, I guess the answer is like, I don't know. Like, I think, it's, I think it's really hard in that, like the thing that I've found more and more useful is building my own boundaries and making them hard or soft. And that comes with like a whole bunch of privileges. Um, but going, nah, this is the way I want to work. And if you're not open to that, or at least having that conversation, then maybe I don't want to work with you. Um, and then obviously there's, tons of knock-on effects from that. But I do believe that like, we are in a place that I don't think people can say no to having a conversation about it. Can I also build up on a point as well? So I find that um, by not taking the job because they won't accept you being sustainable, they'll give it to another designer or another director who doesn't care about sustainability as much. And then we're back in that cycle of like, nobody's taking the next step and nobody's putting their foot down and saying, we need to change Mm. Now, I, I, I wonder if there's something in like Will's slide with all of the different organizations and networks and stuff. It's sort of like another thing that those organizations and networks can maybe act as is, mm. is almost like a, a sort of like union of sorts to sort of go, well, it's not just me. I'm here with all of these, this other network of people who are thinking like me. And I guess like, yeah, it's, it's a sort of, I hope, like an unwritten pact of being like, well, like, don't just take that job because X, Y, Z. It's, it's, it's conversation. It's like being open and transparent with each other and saying what we found difficult and sharing. Yeah, I don't know, but I feel like you've got a more articulate thing to say. <laughs> I don't know that it's any more articulate. Um, uh, I think a, a couple of ways that I could respond to that. Firstly... I think the most important thing is to know what you care about, where you, exactly as you said, where your hard and your soft sort of boundaries are. And if you decide you can't do something, it's no, there's nothing bad whatsoever in not doing it. It's not your responsibility to take every single job so that it's done as best as it can be. Like, theatre is a terrible, terrible world for putting huge amounts of responsibility on individuals. Yeah. And, and we can't except as individuals, as designers, we can't accept that responsibility. And in fact, if you turn down jobs, and if other people turn down jobs, then those producers will eventually learn that they're not going to get mm -hmm. the people that they want to work with like that. It might take a while. And, and it's, you know, of course, there's a huge amount of privilege in being able to turn down a job, um, particularly when you're starting out. Um, and, that, and that is a very difficult decision to do. I don't think, I, I don't think, I'm just, I, as you were talking, I was sort of trying to look back. I have never had anybody say that they, that they won't do sustainable things more sustainably when I've brought it up. I've had all sorts of people say, yes, we'd love to do that, and then not really do anything. Mm -hmm. And I've had all sorts of people say, yes, we'd love to do that, and then not know how to do it, or even be more honest and say we don't know how to do it at the beginning. Um, and I've had lots of, lots of situations where I've had to sort of keep pushing it constantly when, once I've got the job. But I've never had somebody say, we're not going to, don't care. Because I think most people now know what an idiot they'd look if they, if they said that to you. Um, I think that the Green Book is incredibly helpful in, in this as a way of sort of being very explicit with what you want to do. Um, and, it, and then suddenly it's not you on your own. You're not this crazy person coming in saying, I've had this radical idea that we change everything. You're saying, there's an awful lot of very established people working hard on this. Here's a load of really useful resources. Where can we pick something up on it? And so I think sort of going in gently, but with something very concrete, I think is really, really helpful. Um, I, I think got, those are my I've got one very quick thing is just to highlight, I probably shouldn't mention MPOs today with everything that's going on, but the Arts Council have put a real, one of the four investment principles is environmental impact. So what the Arts Council are looking for in producers and funded organisations is how practically the organisation is responding to that investment principle. So it, it should be something, particularly that funded 
producers are taking incredibly seriously. Um, but yes, I'll not say any more about MPO right now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, there was one other thing I forgot in that, which is very much on that point, that a huge amount of the, in fact, as you covered really well in your, just, you know, all your pictures that you had of, of the way things were being done in the rep, which is a, a large, big operation working on this, an awful lot of the sort of big work that's being done on this is being done by big organizations, and they need designers to push it. Mm -hmm. On the materials, they like I was talking to somebody from the RSC the other day who's saying that the, what he finds the hardest, he's the head of production at the RSC, finds the thing he finds the hardest is when the designer says, I don't want to do that. I want, you know, my plastic or I want this thing that I want because that's what I want it to look like. And he's there, you know, all of his workshop is there going, how on earth can we make this more sustainably? Whereas if his designer comes in and says, you know, what do I need to do to make this more sustainable? Mm -hmm. They've got hundreds of answers already. So, it, so I think actually huge numbers of people who we think don't want it because it's going to be annoying, they're crying out for it. Mm -hmm. We just have to get it in in the right way. <laughs> also, again, not to say that this is like absolutely on, on like one person at all, but like, like we were saying, the Theatre Green Book is really new and people have been like have developed in environmental sustainable practices for, for like decades. So I think that there's also something in saying, well, I, I'm going to work in this way no matter what. And maybe I don't even, if I really think that they're going to not give me the job because of it, just go, J I'm just not going to mention it. I'm just going to mm, do, do it anyway. <laughs> I think that's really true. Are you a member of the Society of British Theatre Designers? They have, a, they have a sustainability working group, um, which is very supportive and, and really keen to you know, help everybody sort of think about things. So if you get there, then that's useful. Do we have another question from the audience? Person in the grey jumper, if you want to say your name as well. What's your name? No, it's Michelle, and that's a question. Um, Michelle has a question, and they are asking, what would you feel about selling props on that have already had a life? So Michelle's question was, how would you feel about selling props on that have already had a life previously? Sh shall I go first? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, is the, is the short answer. I think, speaking as an organisation with stores, we make a judgment call on the end of a project of whether that's a thing we want to take into our stores. And then we work with other cultural organisations about sharing those resources. Um, we make a judgment call on whether that's a good use of storage space, because storage space is a resource. Um, and if it's not there, we currently then go do everything we can to sell that on. So we either put it on set exchange, we put it on eBay, we reach out to informal organisations that we've got. Um, Sustainable Arts West Midlands is in the process of trying to create a more formalised network that we can share that information in the West Midlands and there's other similar organisations around the country, uh, sort of more regionally, but yes is the short answer. Anything to stop it going in the bin. Thank you. Thank you. I think we've got a question from... Um, sorry, my name is Trudy, and the question is for Will. How do you find technology that's sustainable? For example, I have a, a theatre company. We are zero waste, but we need a PA system. We say we don't buy anything new, so we can't buy a PA system, and we can no longer hire it. It's just too expensive. So we could get a second-hand one, but then is the quality less? Like, how do you deal with that situation, for example? Uh... <laughs> That's yeah, a million well. dollar question. <laughs> um, uh, the way that we work, we mostly hire things because we have a relatively constrained time period where we need it for. Um, after that, I, so our, our, not specifically technology, but our current approach to, to sort of trying to think about the materials we use in general is a sort of rule of 
do we need it at all? If we do, can we get it second hand? If we don't, could we change what we need from it in order to be able to get it second hand? Um, thinking about how that applies to technology, it, I think it's the same route, really. It's, you could spend a really long time researching you know, different brands and sort of trying to get to the bottom of what was or wasn't the most sustainable produced. Personally, I think you'd use up all of your energy and you'd, like, that would be it. You wouldn't have any energy to make the show left. And, it, and it's a complete waste of time because the difference would be tiny. Um, I think that the big questions are making sure that you specify what you need sort of very precisely so that you can, you're not sort of getting something that's far bigger or far more fancy and does loads of extra stuff that you just don't need out of it. Um, if you can if you can buy it secondhand, then great. I, we buy quite a lot of technology secondhand um, where we can, you know, different thing. And you just have to do it a bit carefully. There are, you know, certainly with, with sound equipment and things like that, there are places that specialize in that stuff. Um, and, you know, if you're making sure that whoever is the one, you know, actually making the purchase is somebody who knows about how, how to tell whether things are any, you know, are in good condition or not. Um, I certainly don't know that with sound equipment, so you know, I would make sure that somebody else went and did that actual purchase so that they could check things were, were what they said they were. Um, um, I think that there are sort of... Technology is, is sort of... There are several things that matter about technology. There's the sort of the embodied footprint of the, of the thing and how it's made. There's how long it's there then going to last you. So, so yes, specify it very carefully, but actually if you think we know that in a year's time we're also going to need another one of these and it's likely to need to do this as well, then you know, get, get something that can cover two years in one, if you can, uh, or to, you know, two projects in one or whatever. Um, think about what you'll do with it afterwards. I think that's really key, you know, whether, whether it's something that you know you're going to keep. You. So we bought a small PA a while ago because we knew that we always need a small PA for rehearsals or you know, for fold back on the back of the stage or all sorts of things. Um, and the fact that we knew we could keep using it for a long time means that actually that a, that's a, sort of justifies that in a way. Um, yeah, I think, it's, I think the key with sort of second hand is, I think anything we can buy second hand is always better than buying it new, without a doubt. I think the, the tricky thing there is, is knowing what is and isn't worth buying second hand or what is likely to be broken. And, and I think you just have to recognize that you need people who know about that stuff to think about that. And you need to, and in talking to them about it, you need to stress how important it is that for, to get secondhand stuff where it's sensible. Because a lot of people think, oh, everything new is always better, because that's sort of how we live in the world at the moment. Um, I don't think that's a terribly helpful answer, probably, but. <laughs> Thank you so much, Will. Um, also, on that note, we do have a panel happening later day, today on theatre and new technology, so do check that out. Thank you so much for our incredible panelists. We've had Josie, Will, and Susie. Thank you so much for turning up in person and online. I've been Darcy Spat Saber. Thank you so much to our BSL interpreters as well. And make sure you head to the marketplace and to the rest of the panel talks happening today. Enjoy your day. Mm.